again, everybody, and welcome to Kane Sports Countdown to Kickoff as the Miami Hurricanes prepare to go play the North Carolina State Wolfpack in a big ACC game on Friday night. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Canesport.com, joined today by Justin Williams of the Wolfpacker, and we're going to dive deep into this North Carolina State team that's had a very interesting start to the 2020 season and try to, to decipher a little bit what everybody might see in Friday night's ball game. And um, Justin, welcome to Kane Sports Countdown, the kickoff. And you guys have had quite a little bit of a ride there in, in, in the first half of the, of the season. Uh, NC State was not expected to be very, very good. Um, but they came out and they upset Wake Forest 45-42 in their opening game, lost to Virginia Tech 45-24, but then put up a 30-21, 30-29 victory at Pittsburgh and a 38 21 victory at Virginia, which uh, was, was very impressive. And suddenly everyone's saying, wow, this North Carolina state team is going to be competitive in the ACC this year. And then they lost quarterback Devin Leary, which created all kinds of other drama uh, when he broke his leg in the, in the, in the Duke game a couple weeks ago. And uh, just, just, you know, just a lot of ups and downs. So let's, let's start off with the big picture, how surprised are the people in rally at just how competitive NC state has been this year? Well, Gary, thanks for having me. I think that was a pretty solid recap of where NC state season has wound up as it leaves the bye week and heads into its fourth ranked matchup of the season against the Miami hurricanes on Friday night. I do have to correct you real quick. It's Raleigh for the fine listeners here in North Carolina. I know uh, that name has been mispronounced often here with, you know, the election night and everything, North Carolina in the spotlight. So Raleigh, North Carolina will be where the Miami Hurricanes will be on Friday night. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, expectations entering the season were low, particularly for media, you know, coming off of that 4-8 and season last year. Um, you know, this was a team that I think most in media and maybe even the coaching staff would be content with a 500 type record to end the season. Um, but the four and two start was, was definitely surprising. I think to both fans and media, um, you know, the Wake Forest game entering that game, I think the final spread in that contest was about one point with Wake Forest being the favorites is a rather toss up game. And now it looks like you know, Wake Forest is becoming one of the better teams in the ACC. So that win is looking more and more impressive by the week. Um, but it's important to note that in that game, backup quarterback Bailey Hockman was the starter, played throughout the entire game against Wake Forest. And it may have been NC State's best offensive performance of the season thus far. Um, of course, Hockman will be the starter again on Friday night as of the death chart on Monday morning. Um but, yeah, Devin Leary came in in game three. You know, the Virginia Tech game was was a real disappointment. I think, you know, from an NC State perspective, that was a game where they got completely manhandled on the offensive and defensive lines. And I wouldn't specifically point towards quarterback play in that game for the reasoning behind the loss, although it had, you know, something to do with it. Hockman was certainly not in his same form as he was in the Wake Forest opener. Um, But, you know, the three-game win streak that included the upset win at Pittsburgh, you know, I know Pittsburgh has kind of gone on a little bit of a drought ever since then. But, you know, give some credit to NC State for kind of starting that trend because Pittsburgh was ranked number 24 in the country at that time and still has one of the nation's best defenses. So that was a very strong performance for Devin Leary. That was his first start of the season. He threw for about 330 yards, four touchdowns, and no picks. And he's played pretty solid ever since. But, of course, he broke his fibula in the third quarter of the Duke win, which was the last the NC State's most recent win. Um, and then, of course, from there, Bailey Hockman goes in to finish that game. NC State beats Duke. And then they got – Again, completely manhandled pretty much from the from halftime on in Chapel Hill entering the bye week. So, you know, there's been some some high ups and some low downs, and I think, you know, this bye week has come at just the right time for NC State as it was starting to, you know, feel the injury bug again as it did last year. Um, but there will be some, you know, important pieces coming back 
I don't expect Devin Leary to come back this season. He certainly won't be back for this game. But all in all, you'll be seeing a healthier Wolfpack team than you did in Chapel Hill uh, a couple Saturdays ago. Yeah, and they lost that game um, uh, four, 48 to 21. It, it, you know, they seem to be a team in a little bit of disarray, not really sure who they wanted to play quarterback. Uh, they put the freshman Ben Finley in for a huge chunk in the middle of the game, um, went back mm-hmm. to Hockman. So um, that right there told us, I think, that uh, Dave Doran is not quite sure who, he, who his quarterback is right now. And um, that could obviously be a drama that continues against Miami on Friday night. So, you know, I've always had a real high opinion of Doran. I was, you know, I have always felt that he's a coach that was able to take less and and do more with it and and, and be competitive. And it was kind of surprising uh, the way it fell apart last year. They went uh, four and eight, which was their first losing record since 2013. And um, I guess that I'm sure that created, you know, some doubts up there coming into this season that, you know, he probably was able to erase a little bit with, with, with you know, by putting up the, the four victories so far this season. I'm sure that, you know, put people at ease. I don't think anybody expects NC State to compete for ACC titles right now. Um, but they mm-hmm. are without question, Justin, one of those teams in this conference that has several of them. You could talk about Wake Forest. You could talk about Boston College uh, as being that type of team that are just good enough to where if a team like Miami comes in on Friday night and doesn't play its best game and makes mistakes and, you know, leaves points on the field and things like that, that they can be in the game in the fourth quarter. Oh, no doubt. I think that's a great assessment. You know, I, I, I really like that comparison with NC state to teams like Wake Forest and Boston college, you know, not teams that are going to really contend for an ACC championship and, you know, frankly, would probably be, you know, manhandled just like most teams by Clemson. But, you know, the other ranked teams in the conference, they could definitely put up a good fight, you know, if those teams enter the contest uh, not completely focused. You know, you kind of saw it with Carolina. Carolina, they were completely focused going into that game with NC State. They were coming off their first loss of of the season, the Florida State, a disappointing road loss for them. They woke up. They weren't been over the Wolfpack but then they kind of fell asleep the next week against Virginia and lost that game. Um, NC State, however, you know, I think it's quite clear that Friday night Miami will have the talent advantage, no doubt about it. Um, But, you know, if NC State is able to get solid enough play from its quarterback, whoever it ends up being, and I think it's highly possible you could see both Bailey Hockman and Ben Finley at stretches, although throughout this week, Dave Dorn has commented that this is Hockman's opportunity. Um, I think it is important to note that when Ben Finley entered the game against Carolina, that was part of the predetermined game plan. According to Dorn, he was going to go in and get at least a drive in the first half just so he could have some game action in case there was an injury because he would be the next man up. Um, but with that said, you know, if NC State can can get solid enough quarterback play, if they can defend Miami well enough to, I don't know, keep them under 30 and then get the run game going enough, you know, I think this could be a very competitive contest on Friday night. Well, uh, Virginia – gave Miami's defense problems by throwing a lot of wrinkles, a lot of motions, a lot of the formations and, and get gadget plays and things like that, that put the Miami defense on its heels. And um, I'm sure that Doran and his staff obviously watched that game film and saw that. And with a bye week coming into this game on Friday, um, I wouldn't be shocked to see NC state do some of that themselves and maybe throw some things out there that they haven't shown earlier in the season and, you know, maybe a few trick plays and, and, and things like that, that can impact the game. Um, they, they've had success on offense with all their quarterbacks at different times. They've averaged 31 and a half points a game, almost 400 yards a game. So they've shown that they can move the ball at times. Um, Hockman, who was, a, a, I guess, a transfer from Florida state, um, mm-hmm. He's completed 41 of 70 passes so far this year for 531 yards. The knock on him is that he tends to get 
a little careless with the ball sometimes. I mean, he can run. He's a running threat at times, so he brings a lot of things to the table. But he also has shown a propensity to make some bad decisions. Um, I know he's thrown four interceptions that uh, were obviously not real good. And, you know, Finley, on the other hand, and I had the opportunity to watch the game the other day, uh, you know, at least some of it, I thought Finley looked pretty good. I mean, he looked like a true freshman. He made his own mistakes, but I mean, he completed 13 to 20 passes, 143 yards. He had a touchdown, but again, just like Hockman, he had two interceptions. So this NC state offense looks to me like it can do some things, but they shoot themselves in the foot quite a bit. Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, I think you got to give credit to uh, first-year offensive coordinator, or at least first-year at NC State offensive coordinator, Tim Beck. He's coming in from Texas. He spent three years there with Tom Herman. And before that, he had had stints at Ohio State and Nebraska over the past decade. He's come in and done a really nice job, I would say, um, with this NC State offense, you know, considering – where it was just one season ago. He's got the reputation of being a quarterback developer, and so far he's lived up to that reputation. I mean, both Devin Leary and Bailey Hockman have looked much more impressive than their appearances last season. Of course, last year Devin Leary was a redshirt freshman. He was earning his first college snaps, Um, and Bailey Hockman was kind of the more experienced guy. He's a redshirt junior now. He's been with three different programs in his college journey. Um, So he's a coach's son himself. His dad is a high school coach. So I think with Hockman, you know, the, the upside is his understanding of the offense. Um, The coaching staff wants him when he's playing his best, he's an effective game manager. That's, you know, completing enough passes downfield so that NC State's run game can really get going. Um, But as you mentioned, his problems have been just, carelessness with the football the turnovers particularly interceptions and those four interceptions this year it's important to note you know when he throws an interception it's very much an opportunity for not only defense to regain possession but also score some points uh two of those interceptions this year I I know there was one pick six in the Wake Forest game and then in the Virginia Tech game you know one of them could have very easily been a pick six had Hockman not stopped the Virginia Tech defender at like the 10 yard line. So, um, you know, I'd say he, he does a good job of making the most of his interceptions in a comical way. And your analysis of Finley is interesting because I think if you ask many NC state fans who they would want to see start on Friday night, their answer would be the true freshman, Ben Finley. Yes. Well, he looked he good. Some immature. Yeah. He looked, I mean, look, he came in uh, on the fourth drive of that Carolina game. To that point, NC State had only gained, I think, about 27 yards on offense and had only gotten one first down. Ben Finley did that in about two plays. He drives the ball down the field on his first drive, which should have ended in a touchdown. And if not for a complete, you know, strike of bad luck there by fifth-year senior tight end Dylan Parham, Finley threw a pass that easily should have been a touchdown. And, you know, Parham just simply bobbled it, and it was – you know, strangely intercepted in the end zone by the Tar Heels. So, you know, that one was a real kind of worst case scenario for the true freshman in his first red zone visit of his college career. But he came back on the next drive and and led a 75 yard touchdown drive, which ended with a 40 yard pass to NC State's leading uh, or top receiver, senior Emeka Amezi. So, you know, Finley looked really good in his first appearance. I think the, the coach's evaluation in the in the weeks afterwards have, have been that the game got a little fast for him there towards the end of his first appearance. He played a total of five drives. Of course, three of them ended in turnovers. But I would it's important to note that two of those turnovers, the two interceptions, you know, they may or may not be Ben Finley's fault entirely. That first one, he has zero percent of the fault on that. That was pretty much all on the receiver, unfortunately, for Dylan Parham. And on the second one, it was a tip pass from a 6'4 outside linebacker where, you know, yeah, you would have liked to see the true freshman put a little bit more air under the ball on a screen pass. But, you know, it was really kind of a fluky interception, if you will. It wasn't an interception that Carolina was going to run back for a pick six by any means. So, you know, his last, his last turnover was a, was a fumble inside of NC State's own 20-yard line. At that point, NC State was down, I think, 
17 or 18 points. Um, but it was a careless mistake. He shouldn't have done that. That was when his youth really came out. And I think had that not happened, you know, it may have been a more difficult conversation for Dave Dorn and the coaching staff this week. But they seem pretty confident with Hawkman. You know, I think he's Hawkman is probably going to give this team the best chance to win now. Um, and considering the hot start to the season, you know, I think the rationale behind the decision to stay with Hawkman is NC State still has quite a bit to play for, and they don't want to throw in the true freshman quite yet if, unless they have to. Um, but, you know, if, if this game does get out of hand or, or Miami jumps out to a quick lead, I would not be surprised at all to see Ben Finley come into the game. Well, that'll be one subplot, and we'll have some drama there in terms of who's playing quarterback at NC State. I personally think that for NC State to be competitive in this game, they're going to have to be able to run the football. And uh, to, to me, that's where they could have an edge a little bit. Um, decent offensive line. Uh, the center, Grant Gibson, is, is very good. Plenty of experience. Uh, the left tackle, um, I, I can make Guan Yu. Um, is a two-year starter. Miami coach Manny Diaz has called him the best lineman that he thinks Miami has gone up against this year. He, you know, he's played guard mm-hmm. and he played guard earlier in the year and moved to tackle. Um, but a guy that's probably going to play in the National Football League. Um, so, you know, and Miami has had some uneven performances on the defensive side with their in- interior line and their linebackers. And if NC State is going to stay in this game and be competitive I personally think it's going to be because they're able to run the football and I've been extremely impressed by what I've seen of the two running backs for the Wolfpack Um, guy named Zonovan Bam Knight he's got 406 yards averages 5.9 yards a carry Ricky Person uh, 335 yards averages 4.6 yards a carry so far this year and these two can also be a threat catching passes out of the backfield they have a combined 21 catches for 165 yards. So um, I think we're going to see, uh, Justin, a lot of night and a lot of person on Friday. Well, that, that's what NC State fans should certainly hope for. I think you're exactly right that, you know, NC State has to get the run game going to have a chance to beat Miami, uh, particularly with Leary out at quarterback. You know, Hawkman and Finley, they have shown flashes, but – I don't think either of them alone are going to be able to, you know, just launch the ball down the field and beat Miami that way. Uh, NC State's run game has certainly been the positive on offense this season for the Wolfpack. Uh, Bam Knight, he's a true sophomore. He was NC State's leading rusher last season as a true freshman. Uh, He's been very impressive. I think he's got an average of about 5.9 yards per carry right now. And the last time I checked, I think he's a about the fourth best uh, running back, according to pro football focus uh, in the ACC. So, you know, he's a really competitive back. He's a guy that's not afraid to get a little bit of contact. He, uh, he certainly is an elusive back as well. And then Ricky Person um, brings a little bit more experience. He's a junior himself. Uh, he's going to be coming off of an injury in the UNC game. He was concussed in the second quarter, but I believe uh, on Monday, Dave Doran said that he will be back for this Miami game. Um, he's a guy that struggled with injury in the past. You know, he's missed multiple games in each of his first two seasons and so far has not missed a game in 2020. Um, but he's, he gives a little bit more size than Knight, um, not as quick as Knight, Um, but maybe a little bit harder to tackle, particularly when he starts gaining some speed and momentum. Um, But as you mentioned, they can both get involved in the backfield and in the pass game as well. Um, And then another guy to just keep your eye on, he hasn't played as much as he had last year as a freshman, but another sophomore to go along with Bam Knight, Jordan Houston. He's a smaller back. I'd like to call him a scat back. You know, he's gotten maybe – 10% 10% of the carries this year um, in the run game. But in terms of the receiving game uh, from the running back room, he's actually towards the top with receptions and yards. Um, he's a quick, elusive guy. He's got a little bit of Naheem Hines in him, if you will. Um, but, you know, if they want to get the screen pass game going on Friday night, 
he could be another option as in a guy that if he can get into the open field. Well, it doesn't make sense for them to let Miami tee off and come after those quarterbacks. So I'm thinking that yeah, that it, it, I see Dor- I see Doran and Beck challenging their offensive line and saying we need you guys to win up front in the run game. Uh, we're we're, we're going to protect you. We're not going to expose you to Quincy Roche and Jalen Phillips and and the outside pass rush and the the, the blitz packages that Miami loves to bring, especially on third down. Uh, we're going to try to protect you from that the best we can. And you know, you guys up front. We're challenging you to, to, to go win this game. I mean, I don't see any other game plan for NC State from my viewpoint um, looking at it. Now, you did mention Emeka Amezi, I guess he pronounces it, um, as a yeah. guy that they like to throw the ball to. He's, he's a tall receiver, 6'3". He's got decent speed. He's caught 23 passes for 370 yards this year and three touchdowns. So he's a guy that Miami fans should be aware of. And um Miami is very familiar, obviously, with throwing the ball to the tight ends. And uh, NC State's got a decent one in Carrie Angeline. Um, he's, he's got 12 catches this, this year. F- five of them have gone for touchdowns. So when they get, if they get in the red zone, uh, Miami's going to have to keep an eye on Angeline and, and figure out who's going to have him in coverage because he's a, a target that they love to look at when, um, when they get down there inside the 20. Um, so, I, you know, I think um, – Justin, unless you have something else to add, uh, I, I think we've pretty much summed up the NC State offense and, and uh, what their likely game plan is going to be Friday and the challenge in front of them. Yeah, I mean, I guess a couple more points would just be, I think you hit the nail on the head with the receiving core. Amezi has been the top receiver. He's had at least one catch of over 30 yards in each of the past four games. So he's been on a little bit of a hot streak after kind of a slow start to the 2020 season. He had his first season as wide receiver one on this team last year. Of course, he when he came in, you know, guys like Kelvin Harmon and Jacoby Myers and Jalen Samuels were still on this NC State team. So he was kind of benefiting from, you know, being that third or fourth guy and not getting so much attention from the defense. But now that he's had about a year to adjust to that type of attention, it seems like he's gotten a little bit more comfortable. Um, and as long as there's some solid play at quarterback, I would expect at least one expo- explosive play out of a Mezzi. And then Kerry Angelon's a really interesting guy to bring up. He's uh, 6'5". I think he leads NC State with five uh, receiving touchdowns this season. He's a great red zone threat. And he's a guy that a lot of NC State fans would say they want to see him get more involved because, I mean, he's arguably probably the best option in the past game in terms of receivers particularly if you got a guy like Hockman in who's much more effective between the seams than he is to the outsides of the field. So, uh, you know, look for him to possibly get involved if NC State does try to, you know, go with more of a passing threat. But I think you're right about the run game. And, and NC State's offensive line is solid. You know, you mentioned Iki Iquanu. Uh He's a future pro, uh, one of the top greatest guys, according to PFF and the ACC. Uh, Grant Gibson's been playing lights out at center. He's Mr. Consistency. And then they've got some seniority with Joe Sculthorpe at right guard. And they're going to get uh, right tackle Justin Witt back for this game, who has been out for, I think, about the last three games now. So that'll be a nice return presence for NC State to get its pretty much its whole starting lineup on the offensive line back. They're still going to probably go without Tyrone Riley, who began the season at left tackle, but now – Icky Kwanu has – he began the year at left guard, and he's now switched over to left tackle where he's played lights out the past three weeks. So I wouldn't expect any changes there. But, yeah, other than that, I'd say that's a, that's a pretty good recap of where NC State's offense has stood through eight weeks. All right. Now, defensively has been a little bit different for NC State, a little bit inconsistent. Uh, like I said, I saw – a good chunk of the North Carolina game and uh, Carolina was able to run for 326 yards in, in that game and put up almost 600 yards of total offense. So uh, I think it's safe to say that the NC state defense is there to be had for Miami's offense. Uh, it, it, it might be a good opportunity for Miami to get the running game going again. They, they've, they've struggled a little bit with uh, certainly with Cam Harris running the football the last few weeks uh, he, he's been pretty frustrated and, and is looking to bust back out and show some of the things that he showed earlier in the season. And obviously uh, Jalen Knighton and Don Chaney, um, the, the two freshmen. Um, so 
teams have averaged 4.3 yards a carry against uh, NC State. They, they've given up 14 rushing touchdowns. Um, why are teams having such success running the football against the Wolfpack? Well, I think it, it depends on the game. You know, it depends on which NC State run defense is going to show up. If you've only focused on that Carolina game, you'd probably think NC State has the worst run defense in the country. And that would be a fair analysis after allowing Javante Williams and Michael Carter to run all over the field on NC State in Keenan Memorial Stadium last Saturday. Uh, of course, Javante Williams and Michael Carter are two future NFL running backs, so that's not to discount their uh, impact in that as well. But NC State leading up to that UNC game has actually been quite effective against the run against Duke, against Pittsburgh and against Virginia, you know, uh, Virginia, Duke, not so much Pittsburgh, but Virginia and Duke have been somewhat pretty good running teams in the ACC and NC State, I think stopped each of those teams to an average of about 101 yards per contest, which all in all, is pretty good for this NC State defense considering the youth on the roster. I think their average yards per carry in those games was around 3 or 3.1, which is pretty good. So, But, you know, on the other hand, you still have the Virginia Tech and the Wake Forest games. Uh, Virginia Tech has Khalil Herbert, and nobody's been able to stop Khalil Herbert this year. Um, And then uh, I'm drawing a blank. Kenneth Walker for Wake Forest. You know, he had a solid game against NC State, had about 150 yards, but ran the ball about 35 times. So, all in all, NC State's actually actually played Wake Forest's run game, you know, better than other teams in the ACC. So, you know, NC State has had its struggles with the run defense, but I wouldn't say it's a predetermined notion that NC State's going to allow Miami to run all over the field on Friday night. You know, they haven't had too much experience with a – a mobile quarterback, which does give me some worries with Derek King coming to town on Friday. Uh, the one game that you could really look at as a true mobile quarterback that NC State played was that Virginia Tech game uh, when uh, Hayden Hooker was out, uh, but they had those two backups who were both pretty mobile themselves. Uh, Quincy Patterson came in for a good chunk of that chain uh, of that game, and then Braxton Burmeister. Uh, was pretty effective on the ground as well against the Wolfpack. So, all in all, you know, the reasons to why a lot of the fans would tell you it's the three-man front, but in reality it's really just how well does this NC State team tackle on any given night. Uh, They've had three really good solid solid tackling performances in those three games I mentioned where they stopped teams to 101 yards on, on the ground per game. Um, but if you look at the games where it's gotten out of hand on the ground, you really you really look at those missed tackles and you say it wasn't it wasn't players not in the right place. It was just players not executing. Well, they're gonna they're gonna look at the game tape and they're gonna see Miami's offensive line struggling at times against Virginia, particularly up the middle. And I, I think they're gonna be looking for. Um, Alim McNeil, their defensive tackle, to wreak a little bit, a bit of a ha- of havoc there. He he is a kid that can get decent push up the middle. He, you know, he's had some ta- some tackles for losses this year. Um, actually, has 45 quarterback pressures since 2018. That's an interesting stat. Um, so McNeil is a guy that could create some problems for Miami on the interior of the defensive line. Um, on the outside. Um, Daniel Joseph loves to get after the quarterback. So, like, look, let, let's just, let's say they load up and they say we're not going to let Miami run the ball, okay? And they 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 do what they feel they need to do to try to keep Miami from running it down their throat the way North Carolina did, which it would be an obvious reaction to what happened in that game. And when they look at Miami's personnel, and Miami is going to be looking to get the Eric King a little bit more active in its run game. I, I think that that's uh, an adjustment that they have pretty um, explicitly said is, is, is in their um, agenda. Uh, you know, they feel King can be more of a factor uh, in, in running the ball and, and keeping it himself a little bit more. So I think we'll see some of that Friday night, but if Miami has to throw it, you know, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the, the, the greatest thing in the world for NC state, because 
uh, opponents are hitting almost 60% of their throws, and, and they are averaging 265 passing yards a game against the NC State defense. So it's not like you can't throw it on these guys also. Um, so I think Miami offensive coordinator Rhett Lashley will have a lot of different options at his disposal depending on how the game goes. He gets uh, Brevin Jordan back at tight end, which um, you know is a big deal for, for Miami, and um, they're going to have to account – for him. So personnel wise guys that we haven't maybe mentioned yet. Um, I know Drake Thomas is a linebacker that NC state coaches feel um, pretty darn good about um, their Peyton Wilson is another one that that's, that's a decent outside linebacker. So um, the linebacker spot is probably the strength of the defense, but um, the place where I see that Miami might potentially really be able to attack is the secondary. They, um, they look to me like, you know, just from some of the different things I've seen in the first half of the season that they, they let a lot of guys run loose at times and you can hit big plays on them. Um, Give us a little bit of a summation on the back end of the Wolfpack defense. Well, the secondary is very young. Um, now they are going to get their most important player back, and I would argue that this pl- individual is the most important player on NC State's defense this year because of the youth in the secondary, and that's going to be safety Tanner Engel. He's a junior. He's a team captain. He missed the Carolina game, and he missed the Virginia Tech game. Oh, by the way, those were the two games that NC State lost this season and let up an average of, what, 46.5 points a game. Um, so he's going to be back on Friday night, and that's a huge return for this NC State defense, not only in pass coverage, but I would argue even more so in the run game. He's a strong tackler. He's a downhill-type safety that's not afraid to, to crack a few players. In fact, he actually uh, got thrown out of the Pittsburgh – no, the Virginia game for a targeting call. Now, I think he's going to learn from that mistake, and he's going to – have a little bit wiser head on his on his shoulders moving forward because he realizes that this NC State team really needs him on the field. Uh, but he's a physical presence that, you know, if you're going to circle one guy in that NC State secondary of who to watch, he's definitely the guy. Um, the corners are very young, and then the depth at safety is a really an issue. Um, you know, Jaquine Harris is a true sophomore that's played the most snaps in the secondary at the other uh, safety position for NC State. But then behind him, you know, you've got a former walk-on and redshirt sophomore, uh, Isaac Duffy, who has played really well in limited snaps, but I still don't think he's a guy that NC State feels very comfortable and playing a lot of snaps. And then you've got a true freshman in Devon Boykin, who's highly touted, super athletic, but just not there yet in his development. Um, the nickel position has been a crucial one for NC State. Uh, they've got um, Jason Pierre Lewis or Josh Pierre Lewis as the backup there. He's a true freshman. But James Baker or Tyler Baker Williams, excuse me, uh, he's really another X factor in the secondary. He's been out for a couple games this season because I think he's gotten dinged for contact tracing protocol twice in September. Um, so He'll be back as well. And this, this NC State secondary that you're going to see on Friday night should be its healthiest yet this season. Um, so that should uh, bode a little bit better for, for people wanting Wolfpack to win and maybe not so much for the Miami Hurricanes. But I think you're right in the assessment that there is opportunity there. Um, the corners is kind of a three-man rotation. You've got Malik Dunlap, who's a redshirt sophomore. He's tall, six foot four. So he's a real physical presence. Uh, he's, he's probably been the most consistent guy, uh, particularly in coverage, and he's played the most snaps. And then you've got Cecil Powell, who's a sophomore, and you've got Shaheen Battle, who's a redshirt freshman, but is a guy that very easily could have accepted a scholarship offer, offer to go to Clemson. So that kind of gives you an idea of his talent level. They're just young. I mean, that, that's really what it comes down to. There's a lot of talent, and they've stepped up really big at times. You know, you – I mean, I know Pittsburgh threw the ball all over the field. Kenny Pickett, I think, had 412 yards in that game. But they did make crucial stops when it was required. And you can look at other examples of that through NC State's first six games. So, you know, as for your comment on the linebacker core, 
you know, I think that's a great assessment that that is certainly the strength of defense. Uh, Peyton Wilson would be my X factor guy in that linebacker core. He had 19 tackles in the Duke game and also had two interceptions in the Carolina game. I still think he had double digit tackles, but he was dinged up uh, early on in the first half. He had to go to the, to the tent on the sideline and he just wasn't himself throughout that game. So I think the bye week will give him an opportunity to get back to full strength and you could potentially see uh, an energized Peyton Wilson. Drake Thomas is a great young guy. Um, middle linebackers, redshirt junior Isaiah Moore, who's really the true captain of this team. Uh, he has underperformed a little bit throughout the first six games of the year compared to where the preseason expectations had been. Um, and a guy that you know has just struggled with his tackling. If he can get his tackling under control, then I think he'll have much better performance. But really, you know, up front, the the number one guy by light years is Aleem McNeil, who's a future pro. I would consider him gone after this year for NC State. And he's a guy that leads Power 5 interior linemen in defensive grading, according to PFF, uh, of guys that have had at least 15 snaps. He hasn't had one game with a rating below 70, which I think 64 is the benchmark for an average performance. So he's performed above average consistently in every single game. Um, But, yeah, I think those would be really my main guys to watch on this NC State defense. All right, I'd be remiss now if I didn't call out the Wolfpack a little bit here for their relatively lame imitation to the Miami turnover scene. <laughs> and uh, they call it the turnover bone, okay? It's a, it's a red bone with the NC State mascot and dogs on it. Um, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. It's yeah, like no, Miami. Well, okay, well, first of all, it's, it's the takeaway bone. Uh, Annabelle Myers, the SID here, was very quick to correct the media. Oh, the takeaway uh, right bone. That okay, bone. Apo- apologies on that front. But, uh, no, but yeah, no it's funny. It's it, it's funny. Like we've seen so many ever since Miami unveiled the turnover chain in 2017. We've seen so many crazy. You know, um, we we saw Florida State have come up with a turnover backpack, and you know now we got the takeaway bone at NC State. It's it's fun. It's funny. Um, but, uh, oh, yeah, well, I, I mean, mean, NC State and almost every other team in the country is about ripped off Miami at this point with some sort of sideline prop, if you will, for whoever gets yeah. the turnover. But, uh, yeah. hey, I mean, if everyone's copying you, that means you're doing something right. All right. Well, in conclusion, uh, does, does NC State have a chance Friday night? I think so. I mean, they're coming off of a bye week where they're going to be uh, good shape health-wise. Um, you know, you'd have liked to see Devin Leary healthy for this game, and if he was healthy, I'd say that this will be a one-possession contest. But I would predict, in my predictions, I have NC State losing by eight points. I think it'll be a tight game. I think it'll be a four-quarter game. But ultimately, I do think that Miami's talent will outweigh uh, NC State's just enough for Miami to – to leave Carter Finley with yet another win, uh, even if they start off Friday night a little bit sleepy. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it, I think it'll be another typical ACC game where, you know, you've got coaches that do a good job of game planning. They they come up with enough things to, to keep their team close. And, uh, you know, I agree that I think Miami's got a few extra playmakers maybe that, that, that might tilt the scale in, in their regard. But uh, it should be a fun game to watch. Either way. So, uh, Justin, we thank you so much for your time today and giving us some great insight into NC State. And uh, Friday night, 7.30 kickoff um, on ESPN. Uh, For those of you that will be watching on TV, um, it'll be interesting to see, can the Hurricanes break their string of poor games coming off a bye week? Miami has not played very well coming off bye weeks lately. I personally think it's coincidental. Um, but we'll see what happens on Friday night. So for Justin Williams of the Wolfpacker, I'm Gary Furman. Thank you for joining us today on Kane Sports Countdown to Kickoff.